time it is. Welcome back to another episode of Thinker vs. Speaker, where I, Marissa the Thinker, sit down with different guests, and we talk about all things, anything, everything, life, love, relationships, spirituality, whatever we want to talk about. So with that being said, if you're into that kind of thing, strap up, tune in, get ready to go. All that said, we don't know what we're going to talk about before we get into it. So take this as a general trigger warning. If you're easily triggered, you have some options here. Um, one, you could leave a comment so we can create a dialogue about it. That's what this show is about, creating dialogues to get to understand each other better and the different things that we're dealing with. If you're not into that, that's okay. Go ahead and click off if that's what you have to do. But we hope you come back next week when we talk about something different and you can hop right back into it like nothing ever happened. <laughs> now, with that being said, we got a brand new guest to the show today that I'm really excited about. We have Karishma Gautam, who is a self-love expert. She is on a mission to help over a million women reach their self-love goals and to fall in love with themselves by 2025. I'm super excited to hear more about you. you you're a self-love coach who helps women through uh, learning Oh God, I, I'm I'm tripping over my words here. Do you want to help me out here? Tell me a little bit about your mission. Yes. So thank you, Marisa. I'm so glad to be on your podcast. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I am a self love coach, and uh, I help women with uh, increasing their self confidence, self esteem, raising their uh, like realizing their self worth, going forward to this towards their goals of what they want in life. Awesome, 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 awesome. I'm super excited to have you onto the show and very curious to learn how you got into helping women, into coaching. How did how did that become your path? I'm just so curious because self-love is something it almost feels like there's a new wave, right? It's a new wave of everybody talking about self-love and falling into your falling in love with yourself and the whole soft era, soft girl era. It's popular these days. But you know, it wasn't always such a popular thing. Um, back when I was growing up, that's not the narrative that we were given. Not necessarily. It was, you know. It was a little bit different. Um, you just kind of had to go with what you were given and just kind of take it. And it was about, you know, proving, or at least where I came from, right? Everybody has a different story. If you don't align with it, that's great. But, you know, that wasn't the narrative. And now the narrative is changing a little bit. So it's nice to kind of see the people who are actually doing that work and getting women to really change the narrative for themselves and find a new level of happiness and fulfillment in their femininity. So, yeah. Yes, I can definitely agree to that, that uh, self-love wasn't the norm a couple years ago. And uh, I wish I was uh, the coach that I am for other women now. I wish I had that coach a couple years ago when I was struggling with self-love. I wish I got that coach at that time and uh, I was doubting myself and wondering if I am even worthy in my life, even worthy of having anything in my life. So it was like a long, it's a long story, but I will try to keep it short yeah. for you. So I have uh, always struggled with uh, self-doubt. I have always had self-doubt and lack of self-love, especially while growing up and uh, most of my adulthood, a uh, part of my adulthood as well. And uh, the reason for that is obviously the messages I got growing up from other people, from adults in my life who are like, uh, they they didn't know any better, so they couldn't give me the better message. If they had known better, they would have passed you on the better message. And by the adults, I obviously mean my parents and my elder siblings, etc., and other uncle aunties etc that i had in my life i was like uh, uh, growing up i was always told that because you are a woman you you will need to like after marriage your husband will be your everything your god you will need to respect him and treat him like your god and your everything and you will be like as a, like a second class citizen because just because you are a woman you won't be treated with 
much respect and your husband will be your be all and end all so i was uh, and uh, i was told that uh, get married by a certain age and that certain age for me was 30 i was told that get married by 30 or you will have to settle for a job because all good ones will already be taken by that time so you better find a one before 30 so you can get married yeah getting married was one of my biggest dreams i even though I had received miss messages like that, that your husband, you will need to treat him like God, etc. Even though I got such a mixed, uh, confused messages, uh, getting married was really one of my dreams. I do want to get married. I do want to find the one with whom I can spend the rest of my life. And as I started reaching that age of 30, I was beginning to lose hope on uh, ever finding the one. And by the time it get to 30, I was like uh, uh, trashing with uh, self-doubt and lack of self-love and wondering like, why would anyone ever want to get married to me? Because what's wrong with me? I can't even find a partner. Yeah. So... That was really, it really had a big impact on my self-esteem and self-confidence. And uh, over time, I realized that uh, how I am, uh, how I need to become my own best friend, my own best lover first, before I can attract the one with whom I want to marry. First, I need to learn to love myself before I can expect someone else to give me that love and like the realization that uh, uh, just uh, the fact that if I don't have a relationship or if I have a relationship that doesn't define my self-worth, I am still worthy whether I have a partner or I don't have a partner. So definitely that realization was kind of the light bulb moment that went on. And uh, after that, I realized how many women struggle with the same uh, lack of self-love and low self-confidence. So I decided to turn my mess into my message of over helping other women overcome the same that I have overcome in my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I can resonate with that story a lot. Um, and my journey and just, you know, having this platform and being able to talk about it, um, actually kind of put into perspective how many other, uh, women, um, and, you know, something, you know, actually men even deal with, you know, self-love issues as well. So just people in general who deal with, uh, a lack of self-love and not really having the greatest self-worth, um, and, I think it's something that is understated in society. So um, let's talk about that a little bit of why it's important. And ironically enough, going beyond why it's important, um, you said something about you have to be that person first to attract it. And that's something yes. I agree with as well. So let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you feel like you have to be that person first in order to attract what it is that you're looking for? So it's that uh, common law of law of attraction. So like attracts like if you, for example, if you want to attract a partner who is honest, who is honest and loyal to you, you need to become honest and loyal to yourself and to others as well, hopefully, before you can attract that partner because the energy you are putting out in the world, the same energy will come back to you. So if you are kind of, if you are a cheater, if you love to cheat and enjoy taking advantage of other people, then like if that is your, uh, I am not saying you, but anyone who is listening, yeah. if that is what you love to do, then maybe you need to work on yourself first before you can work on attracting a partner because obviously if, if you are someone who is uh, not, uh, who is uh, like, who loves to cheat, enjoy taking advantage of other people and you want to attract a partner who is honest, maybe you will, maybe somehow you may attract a partner who is honest, but he or she will eventually figure out that you are not the best person for him or her. 
and then that person will leave and you will be by yourself again. So why not work on becoming the best person for yourself first before you can attract that best person in the uh, in your relationship? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, something that I feel like is important when it comes to relationships is the ability to self-reflect. Right. Because exactly. we, can, we can always see what other people do that's wrong, but it's a lot harder to see what it is that we do wrong. Right. Like, I'm pretty sure everybody can talk about any one of their old relationships and tell you everything that that other person did that wasn't great. But um, not everybody can look at that relationship and say what they did wrong as well. Because it does, exactly. take, it takes two to tango. You know, if we're in a situation or a dynamic, there's something about that situation that at one point in time attracted us to it, you know? And sometimes looking at what went right or what went wrong in a relationship can tell us a lot about what we need as people. At least that's what I'm learning from my own experiences. Exactly. And yeah, that's true. Like I remember I was talking to one of my clients a couple of days ago and she was in a narcissistic abusive relationship. Uh, she left that relationship when she got in touch with me. She left that relationship. However, she was still holding on to that anger and resentment for her partner. And she was like blaming him for he did this, he did that, he is he used to abuse me, he will beat me up. And I was like, where is your part in the, where are you owning up to your part in the relationship? Why are you not taking up uh, your esteemed responsibility? Where is that ownership? And she was like, taken aback and tried to be defensive that, what do you mean, where is my part? Because I yeah. always put myself last. I was giving him all the time and I tend to overgive and I always put myself last and I was like and that's, that's the where problem. your part is. Yeah. Why did you put yourself last? Yeah. Because you were putting yourself last, you're like you are the person who is putting yourself last and what do you expect from another person? He will also put yourself last when you are doing that to him, when you are doing that to yourself. And like when you are aware becoming aware that uh, he is narcissistic and abusive, like What's the point of staying in a relationship just because you wanted to be in when you understood that it was abusive? You could have left out and moved out of the relationship before you like she did, did uh, I think she remained in the relationship for about two, two and a half years, and it was kind of getting after one year or so, it got very narcissistic and abusive. And I was like, when, when the first time he raised his hand on you, why didn't you walk out of the relationship at that time itself? You continue to stay in it and he was like, he continued to get more and more abusive as time passed. So your part is accepting responsibility for the fact that you allowed him to walk all over yourself. You didn't set the healthy boundaries that you needed to set. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and something that I want to point out, because you know there's going to be the people out there that say, but, 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 but here's the thing, because and no, nobody here is saying what that person did was okay. No one condones it. You know, I, I feel like everybody can agree with the fact that you do not deserve to be abused. Everyone okay. can agree with that. No one should be putting their hands on them, on you. No one should be talking to you in a demeaning way. And I think part of healing, you know, and this, this is difficult, but you have to get past how you've been treated. And that is so hard. And I'm saying that as somebody who has personally had to do it, you know, there's a fine line because you have to acknowledge the fact that I am not excusing that other person's actions, but I cannot control that other person's actions, right? I can put up all of the boundaries in the world 
and I can say, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that uh, and, and, and eliminate contact, right? Because if you're with a true narcissist, that's what you have to do. You have to go no contact anyway in order to heal. But once you do that, that person can go and just find another person and continue that cycle, right? And exactly. we get so caught up in the, well, this is what they did to me. Well, this is what they did to me. Well, guess what? Now they're doing that to somebody else, you know? Exactly. And you're still here stuck on that and you're not moving forward, right? So I feel like these statements and coaching, like the types of coaching that you do, it sounds tough, right? It sounds hard because someone who's still in that might get triggered and be like, what do you mean? What about me? But no, we're to help. We're here to help you get past that. We've acknowledged that this has happened already. We know it was bad. And this is why you left that relationship. And this is why you're here right now, because you want help getting past this. And in order to get past it, hard truths have to be acknowledged. And that's where the self-reflection aspect comes into place, because it's just like, well, you have to acknowledge what you did because I had to let go, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, I I left those people cool, but now I have to learn how to forgive those people because if I hold on to it, I bring that same energy into a new situation. I just exactly. bring that, I bring that same feeling into a completely new dynamic and there is no progress. Exactly. And yeah, as you said, there is no condoning their actions. What they did was wrong. But again, you can either be a victim in that situation by blaming him or her that he did this, he abused me. Why did he do this to me? Or you can accept responsibility and be a victor in the relationship by accept, accept, accepting responsibility for the part you played and making a vote to yourself for not getting into this pattern of relationship ever again. Yes. Yes. And and that's how you can make that vow is by knowing how you got there in the first place. You know, exactly. that's where the self-reflection comes into play because you, if you don't know how you got there, you'll never know how to not go back. Exactly. You might yes. end up taking the wrong steps to try to prevent going back. You know, but people say it all the time, if you go through a bad relationship, it's just like, well, if this relationship doesn't work out, then maybe I'm just not supposed to get, have one. Okay. Maybe I'm just supposed to just, and it's, it wasn't about that, but I'm sure there were things that you could have learned from those situations that will better prepare you the next time around. So you could really get what it is that you want. And I think that goes into mindset coaching if if i'm not mistaken that's something that you specialize in correct helping people change their thought patterns exactly yes that's what i specialize in and like there is uh, often a myth among uh, people that the best way to get over a relationship is to find another relationship and you get out of one and yeah that's uh, rubbish because if you if you got out of an abusive relationship, you need to work on yourself, heal your heart, forgive the other person, get into that positive vibrational energy before you can get into another one. Because if you are in the same uh, resentment, anger, and you run to find another relationship, you will likely attract the same kind of partner that you had last time. Yes, yes, yes. It's because we haven't learned what not to look for, right? Um, so um, a, a personal example that I can give is I met someone who reminded me of someone else that I had dated in the past. And I actually did not know that I hadn't healed from my past until meeting this person because I would constantly, everything that person would do would remind me of something that the old person would do. And it dictated how I reacted with the new person. Because now I have to do everything that I should have did the last time because I hadn't I hadn't forgiven myself. I hadn't acknowledged what I had done wrong. So when there were ways where I could have dealt with the I, I was dealing with the relationship from an outward perspective 
like she did this, she did that, this is what happened. It's all on her. And I never thought about what I did. And then when I realized I was in a different dynamic, I realized that I was the person that was destroying my relationships because I was reacting based off of something else that was not there. Exactly. It's like, uh, again, like as I said, uh, getting empowered, taking responsibility for the part you played. Like if you are uh, blaming the other person, they did this to me, they did that. You are giving your power away to the other person. You are blaming them, giving your power away to someone else. However, if you are reframing that sentence, that how does this uh, relationship help me grow? How was this serving me? And maybe it was serving you in the way that teaching you what not to look for in the next relationship after you have done your healing. Yeah. So if you reframe that sentence in a positive way, that how it helped me grow, it's a more empowered question to ask yourself instead of saying that, why did he do this to me? Yes. Yes. Now, it's uh, so from your notes, you specialize in neuro-linguistic programming. Is this what that is that we're talking about? Uh, yes. Neuro-linguistic programming is, uh, it's a bit of what we are talking about. It's uh, more like a mind-body connection and uh, reframing our thought patterns, what we think about ourselves, what we think about other people and reframing our like uh, limiting beliefs that are not serving us and uh, I'm not sure if uh, your listeners know what limiting beliefs are so I will explain that please limiting belief can be anything that limits us from achieving our goals in life it's like a lens it is uh, like a lens from which we see the world and for example, if for example, uh, if I have to give an example, it is like um, many women may have that belief that uh, men men only want one thing; they will only take advantage of us for sex. So they are holding on to that filter that oh, men will only want me for one thing. So they are continuously looking at men with that filter that. They only want to take advantage of me, so I better stay away from them or they will only want me for sex. And it's kind of, we we all, as humans, we all want to be right. No one wants to be proven that, no, you were wrong. It's kind of, we all want to be right in life. Yeah. So if we are holding on to that belief that we are, uh, we will only be taken advantage of by men, we will unconsciously attract men who actually do want to take advantage of us and if they do or if they try to take advantage of us we will say to ourselves that i knew i was right because men always always want to take advantage of me yes. so it's a kind of a belief that is holds us back in life for example if if a woman wants to attract a potential partner if she wants to attract a partner but she is holding on to a belief like this it will be difficult for her to find a partner because unless she change that belief into something more empowering that not all men like uh, most men are protectors and providers if she, unless she reframe that into more empowering belief it will be difficult for her to find the right partner yes yes and, and uh-huh so yeah that's uh, like uh in brief that's what a limiting belief is it uh, just holds us back in life it uh it limits us from living the life for a to our full potential absolutely absolutely and 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 i think it's important to address those things because we it's a it's so subconscious it's not something that we intentionally do. It's just something that happens and it kind of dictates our world perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we we look to affirm the things that we believe, which is, is, is what like what you're saying. So I agree with that because we're looking for that 
affirmation. If this is what I believe in my head to be true, the things that I look for, I'm looking to affirm what I believe is true. So um, again, something for me where, again, where you do your self-reflection and you, you learn from mistakes, right? I would deal with people who were emotionally unavailable because I was looking for validation. I didn't know this, but it takes self-reflection to figure it out. So if I'm looking for validation from someone who, cause I'm looking for them to validate my emotions because I am not validating my own emotions. So me being, because I'm not doing that, I am emotionally available and I'm looking for that validation of emotional availability from someone who does not have it. I attracted what I was, but I was exactly. seeking, I was seeking what I needed from someone else who could not supply it because I needed to supply it myself. It creates a different dynamic when you go into something saying, I'm enough. I don't need you to show me that I'm enough because if I don't feel like I'm enough first, I feel like I need to prove it to you that I am. And in the in the process of trying to prove to you that I am, I'm coming across as somebody who doesn't have great self-worth because if I had great self-worth, I wouldn't need to prove it. It's a double-edged sword of compounding things. So it seems so general when you hear people talk about it, like, oh yeah, just love yourself. But it, it comes in so many different layers. It runs so deeply and changing the way that you're able to think about things can really impact what it is that you're able to attract. Because now I'm no longer attracted to people who are emotionally unavailable because I don't have time to try to prove love. I shouldn't have to fight for love. I shouldn't have to do that, you know? And that requires changing your thought pattern and how you view yourself and what it is that you deserve. And it's a, it's, it requires work, but once you're, you do it, it changes, it opens up a whole new realm of possibilities and what life can look like. Exactly. And yes, as you said, that most of it is subconscious. So we are not even consciously aware of it most of the time. And uh, it's like uh, uh, doing that subconscious reprogramming work, which I do for my clients with the help of NLP and hypnotherapy to help them become aware of what the subconscious belief are. And if they are not serving them, they can let go of those beliefs. And uh, like uh, it has, and it has a lot to do with our childhood upbringing, how we were uh, brought up, how we were raised. For example, like uh, I was, uh, my personal experience, it was my personal experience when I was around 10 years old, a man tried to misbehave with me. He he was like a plumber. He came to fix some plumbing issue in the house. And he saw me alone in a room and he tried to misbehave with me. I told my parents and my father gave him a good beating, which was good. He learned his lesson of not messing up with another child yeah. or another woman. But... Uh, when he was gone, my sister told me that all men would only want you for sex, so you need to stay away from all of them. So that was like my own personal belief. At 10 years old, I got that belief from my sister that you need to stay away from men, they will only want you for sex. So yeah. until I did that uh, subconscious reprogramming work, I was holding on to unconsciously, I was holding on to that belief. And Consciously, I was like, I want to attract a partner, where is my man? But so it was kind of a conflict between my conscious and subconscious. And since uh, so subconscious is a lot more powerful than conscious, like subconscious is 99%, 95% more powerful than conscious. So subconscious was obviously winning in that battle between conscious and subconscious until I become aware of what I am what I believe unconsciously about men and relationship and reframe those belief into positive belief, positive empowering belief, which actually works for me. So yeah, it's uh, all about becoming aware of how you were raised in your childhood, what messages you got from your parents. For example, if you, if you were brought up in a 
household where there was a lot of domestic violence and abuse, and if you saw your mother getting abused by your dad, you may grow up with the belief that men, all men are like, all men will take advantage of women by physically abusing them. And unless you do your subconscious programming work, unless you change that belief, you may somehow attract a partner who takes advantage of you by physically abusing you and treating you the same way how your dad treated mom. And then you will wonder why I find such a partner when it was your belief and you were you just proved your belief right because you didn't reframe it. Yes. Yes, because subconsciously that's what you're looking for. Um, I think that's the um the screams of insecurity sometimes, right? That that's what comes to my head anyway. Um, because I don't know about anybody else, right? But like when I hit a point where I'm about to truly let something go, it feels kind of spiritual. Like, because it, it gets to a point where it's like, I cannot hold on to this negative belief anymore. I can't hold on to this limited belief because I'm experiencing the extent of how much this isn't working for me. And it'll be something like, uh, what's a thought? Everyone leaves me, right? So say if you like, okay, I can't let myself fall in love because as soon as I fall in love, they're going to leave, right? Something like that. It could be, a, and it, it's not something that you think constantly. It's very deep rooted and seated within you, right? So when you get to, maybe when you get to a certain point in a relationship, maybe when it gets too deep or it gets too serious or you hit a plateau where you have to let this thing go because it's not gonna work with it, you either break it and let it go or you sabotage everything because you you need to validate this belief in this moment. It's not even that this thing is happening in reality it's happening in your subconscious world because this is what you believe about yourself, right? So it's just like, say if a person, if the belief was what I said before, right? If it gets too deep, that person is gonna leave. So now you're hyper vigilant for the signs of someone leaving and they might not be ready. To, they might not even be on that level they might not even be thinking of it they might just have stuff going on in their world and like say if they're acting a little different well in your subconscious you're you're looking for that person to find something so they can leave you but they're not trying to do that they have their own thing going on in their world right like that your person is a person your person is not an object. Your person is a person and they have things going on just like you do. And it's just like, we'll blow something up out of proportion and we'll overreact. And we'll, and once you finally make that person sick enough and they do leave you, you're like, yep, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and it it's, a, yeah. it's like, it's a, all energy, like our beliefs, our thoughts, emotions, everything is energy. So it's like maybe you are thinking that when I am, a, when it is a subconscious belief and I myself is not consciously aware of it, that I'm holding on to this belief, how can the other person know? But however, because it's all energy, somehow they pick up on that message that she believes this or they will find some other reason to leave if you are holding on to that belief that everybody will leave me somehow it will by energetically it will get transferred to them that i need to leave or yep. something is not working out in this relationship so let's leave and they will leave because you believe that they, everyone will leave me yeah yeah, you can you can like subconsciously drive people away the same way, you know, because you we want to validate the fact that, you know, no, this person isn't going to leave it like in your mind, you're looking for the validation of, oh, this person isn't going to leave because you want to because you have this subconscious thought, but you're actually doing the inverse because you think it's one thing, but it's actually doing something else. So it seems like um, 
Cor again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of says, uh, I kind of heard that you say hypnotherapy kind of helps identify the limited beliefs and like what you're holding on to. I know nothing about hypnotherapy, so I'm very curious as to like how, how you use it and what it's used for. Yes, hypnotherapy can help identify the limiting beliefs and it can also help uh, reframe the belief into something positive and empowering that was for you, um, that was for your listeners. And same with uh, neuro-linguistic programming, they are both kind of similar modalities, even though the techniques that are used in both of them are different. Like hypnotherapy is more of a close eye process. I ask my clients to close their eyes and go deeper into their subconscious. NLP is more like a, it's a, it's a not as much of a close day process because uh, it is more about uh, those uh, consciously conscious thoughts along with subconscious. It works on both consciously and subconsciously while hypnotherapy is more of a subconscious process. So NLP is more like uh, it helps with uh, more uh, reframing more uh, conscious beliefs as well as subconscious so it's not as much of a close day process okay cool that's interesting like like i said i don't uh i don't know much about the hypnotherapy aspect of it but the way that you explained it, it actually kind of reminds me of something that i did with my therapist it wasn't hypnotherapy by any means but she would ask me specific questions that would trigger trigger certain memories that were attached to to certain feelings and it that's actually actually that's what taught me how to self-reflect better um in order to figure out you know where some of these things were rooted in and where they stem from like you know and ironically enough what I found in going through that process is that some of these beliefs and I, I think it's it's like what you explained in the story when you were 10 where you know something will happen and it will create this thought within you and you you just kind of stick with it and you don't think about it anymore it's just like well that's what it is but you know especially when we're younger and uh, a lot of my limited beliefs came from when I was younger. I didn't have the ability to really think through things the way that I think through them now as an adult because I have the experiences. So when you are able to go back in time to that moment where that particular limited belief stemmed from, you can look at it from a couple of different angles and realize like maybe there are some other ways to think about this. And then it creates the process, like kind of like the gears start turning in your head, like after they've been stopped for a while. And it's like you can start moving again. Yes, exactly. And yes, uh, hypnotherapy can also be used, like, uh, for example, if uh, you don't have much remembrance of your childhood, if you don't know what you believe subconsciously, it can help in uh, reminding yourself during the hypnosis session. It, you can remember what you used to believe or what you believe currently that you got from childhood and maybe it is not working out for you. For example, when I got hypnosis, when I learned hypnosis and got a session for myself, did hypnosis for myself, I remembered that, uh, I remembered that belief about men that I had and I realized how it is not serving out for me, serving my best interest and again like it's uh, no point i'm not blaming my sister for giving me that belief because when i was 10 years old she said that to me and she probably said it with the intention that i can keep myself safe i can protect myself from men but obviously yeah. as i grow older it was not something i want to hold on to because i know that men are protectors themselves and they would actually want to protect me instead of me working hard trying to protect myself from them. Yeah. And it's uh, like, a, it's uh, that uh, absolute truth and subjective truth. For example, absolute truth can be something like, which is true for everyone. For example, sun rises every morning. 
So it's like a true thing for everyone in the whole world. No one can deny that sun don't rise every morning. Like maybe it is hidden behind the clouds, but it will still rise every morning. Yeah. However, subjective truth can be something like which is true for one person, but not true for others. For example, maybe men are rapists, they will only take advantage of me if you are holding on to a belief like that, for example. That may be true for you, but if another woman believes that men are protectors, they want to protect me, that will be true for her. So it's yeah. like a, that difference of absolute truth and subjective truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something um, we talk about too, um, just beyond uh, relationships and things. Uh, something, anytime people tell me that, you know, certain things don't exist, I like to challenge it because it's it, it might not necessarily be true. Something that I hear a lot back in my hometown is, you know, um, people in our community don't support each other, you know, and I, I used to think it at the time, but as I kind of broke away from that, I started experiencing like really good support systems. And when I would hear people tell me that now, like, yeah, we don't support each other and all these things. And I'm like, that's not true. And okay. people, you know, will initially look at me crazy and they're like, no, you don't see this. And I'm like, I know it. I know exactly what you're referring to. And that probably is true from your perspective. Because I can't tell you your perspective is wrong. Your perspective is your perspective. But I'm telling you from my perspective, that's not true. I can't wholeheartedly say that that's true when I've seen something else. And that's because I was willing to see that thing that's different. And I think a part of being able to change your inner dialogue is being willing to change it and being willing to see something than our fixed ideals that we have through our experiences. It's not black and white, you know? We grow up thinking the world is black and white. And then as we mature, we realize it's a lot of gray here. And other colors too. It's more than just black and white. There, There's a lot of grays and there's a lot of different colors. There's a spectrum. Exactly. That, uh, what you said about perspective and how everyone can have a different perspective, that actually reminds me of something that I learned in neuro-linguistic programming, which is just perception is projection, which is, uh, it is, which just mean that what we perceive, we project onto the outer world, what we perceive in our world, in our inner world, what we perceive, we just project that onto the outer world, which, the, which is why two different people can go through the exact same experience, but, uh, two different people can have the exact same experience but the result can be different for both of them even though they have that exact they went through that exact same uh, experience for example like two people can join a gym and have a the same person trainer they can have that uh, same diet they can eat the same protein carbohydrates etc fats they can eat everything same and maybe they are doing they are doing the exact same exercise, same personal trainer, they are doing the exact same exercise. But uh, one of them lose weight, the other one did it, which is because they had uh, different beliefs about health. Maybe the, the one who didn't lose weight, maybe he had some uh, <coughs> he had some negative beliefs that were not working out for him or her, that person. Maybe he he grew up in a family where um where there was a lot of physical disease like diabetes, overweight, obese, etc. So maybe that person had that belief because of that upbringing that I will always be overweight because I belong to this family. So he because he is holding on to that belief, he won't he will have trouble losing weight even after all that exercise and gym routine and diet. Yeah. While the other person may easily lose weight after that same exercise and gym routine because he's not holding on to that belief. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's the it's a difference between going into something saying that 
I can versus going into something where it's just like, I don't think I can do this. Those are two different mindsets going into a situation. And the person that goes into the mindset saying that they can most likely will because they're going to look for ways to be successful. The person who goes in unsure is less likely to be successful because they're looking for the different ways that they could fail. Exactly, yes. It's like uh, you know, whether you are uh, whether you are playing the game of life to win or to not to lose, what you are focus on, like if you are playing the game of life not to lose, you are focusing on losing, you are focusing on how do I not lose? So yeah. you are focusing on losing. However, if you are playing the game of life to win, how can I win? You are more focused on winning. Yeah, yeah. Like, obviously, what we focus on, we will attract. And it's uh, like a thing that uh, our, our brain doesn't, in, doesn't recognize negatives. For example, if I say to you, don't think about a purple elephant, the first thing you are likely to think about is a purple elephant. So if you are focusing the game of life not to lose, if you are thinking, how do I not lose? Your brain doesn't recognize the nod. He, the brain is like, how do I lose? Because they don't recognize the nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. That's very true. Like I, uh, I like how you compared it to a game. Cause it, it. Uh, when I was younger, you know how you play tic tac toe with yes. the X's and the O's. So, uh, I would play, and my my mindset when I played would always be on defense and I would play, actually I would play with my dad and my dad would kick my ass. And the reason he would is because I would start the game on defense and I would always be looking for ways to block. And my dad would always win because he was looking for ways to win. I was looking for ways to stay in the game. <laughs> So exactly, would, yeah. yeah so I would always lose and he would be like and it was just like why am I always losing that was why because I wasn't trying to win I was just trying to maintain and the person that was looking to win will win every time because I wasn't exactly. trying to look to put that move in place so I can win so I can get on the offense and be on the winning side no I'm just looking to defend Yeah. That means sense, yeah. That exactly what I was saying. That whether you are playing the game of life to win or not to lose, what you are focusing on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, how did you get into this line of work? I don't think we talked about that. How did this become your mission, helping these women? Uh, yes, uh, as I said, I grew up with uh, a lot of limiting beliefs and things that were not really working out for me. For example, all men will only take advantage of you, stay away from all of them that my sister told me. And then I heard from society and my parents, etc. get married by a certain age or you will have to settle for a job. So, and getting married was something I really wanted. As I said, I really had that desire of finding a partner who, is right for me and being in a loving relationship. When that didn't happen by a certain age, by that age of 30, I was beginning to lose hope on love and romance and ever finding the right partner. And it really have a hit on my self-esteem and self-confidence. And I kind of started questioning myself first that why would anyone want to get married to me? Am I even worthy of finding a partner? Which was, at that time, I really started working on myself, my subconscious reprogramming work. I started doing that. I attracted some coaches who helped me with uh, reframing my mindset, letting go of the beliefs that were not aligned, aligned with me. So once I did that work and once I embraced my own self-worth, I realized how many women struggle with the same and I decided to make this my passion and my purpose to help women overcome what I overcome in my life. 
And why do you recommend coaching? Like who who are good candidates for coaching? Um, do you think? For my coaching, uh, anyone who is having a lot of self doubt and struggling with low self esteem, and again, self doubt is something we will like it. We never reach a point where we are like, I don't have any more self-doubt. It is like kind of a constant thing in our life and we need to work on it because like every time we are starting something new, we will have self-doubt that I have never did, I have done this before, will I succeed? But we need to work on it and tell that self-doubt to be shut up and be quiet yeah. <laughs> because we are doing it and yeah, for my coaching, the good candidates will be anyone who is struggling with low self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, people who may have grown up in a with a lot of childhood trauma and they need to work on that because I help my clients with the same. Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing about coaching or just getting that type of help in general, like learning how to love yourself is a hard journey it is not it's not easy um and it's 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 long it's a lifelong it's a lifelong journey because it never ends um you realize after a certain point like it'll never really be over you're always going to be a work in progress it's something, always something that can be improved and what I find or at least what made it easier for me doing it for myself was having a place of genuine support. For me, it was therapy, but you know, everything doesn't work for everybody. There are different, you know, uh, benefits to, to the different routes. But what I found the most useful was to have a support system in place, That's you know. Having a support system, having a peer group who is supporting you is definitely something important because, yeah, you become the average of the five people you hang out with. So if you are hanging out with five people who are, who hate themselves, who doesn't have self-love, you are likely to become the cis person if you hang out with them enough. Yeah. So yeah, peer group, a supportive peer group is really important. And again, as you said, uh, every not everything works out for everyone. So finding the right coach for yourself who is willing to help you or right uh, support group, whatever you think will work out for you, finding that right thing for yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's really important. Um, And I think doing so too opened up my world. Because like you said, I thought at one point in my life that a relationship was the end all be all. I thought it would complete me. And I thought that it would, you know, that that was the only real true goal that I had at one point in time. And then I realized through this journey is that life is so much bigger than that. You know, um, and I think that goes to say, like, you know, because sure, there are people out there that will say, oh, once you once you hit a certain age, it's a wrap. You'll never if you don't have it by now, then, you know, it, it's not going to come. And I just don't I don't think that's true. And the reason why I don't think it's true, because the world is so much bigger than that. You know, Interesting. If, if I'm dealing with a certain thing like. I'm not the only one. There are plenty of other people who deal with similar things and that have similar stories. And, you know, there are plenty of people who, you know, find it later. I think it's just all about a process. You have to, you have to kind of get to a certain level. If you really want the relationship that's going to last a lifetime, you have to be a person with the skills to make a relationship last a lifetime because we don't talk yes. about the work that relationships are and you have to be at a certain level internally to be able to make a relationship last and and, and to have a healthy one because plenty of people can make a relationship last and it not be healthy and it not be good but you know if you really want to have one that 
is worthwhile and substantial, that takes you to be at a certain point as a person. Exactly. And yes, uh, people will often, because of their belief that marriages are forever, they are made in heaven till death do us part, etc. People will often stay in relationships that are abusive and not in their best interest. Just because they are holding on to such belief, they will stay in a relationship which is not right for them, not right for the other person. But yeah, if you if you want to find a partner who is really suited best in wants your best interest, you want their best interest and you both can help each other grow and evolve in this life. If you want that kind of partnership, then it's like it's, it's time you need to start working on yourself first by getting your emotions and your beliefs right. So you can attract a partner who is right for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I have, okay, so I have a question for you Um, just just because I've had a, another person come on the show before who was a relationship coach. Um, Her name is Brandy and she does, uh, her brand is called Conquering Relationships. And she's also, um, in her story, she'll tell, she'll tell, she'll tell you herself, she's divorced and she's a relationship coach. And people will ask her, like, why should I listen to you if you're divorced? And her thing is, because I've actually learned from, you know, I had to go through a thing. I've been in it. I, I learned what, it, you know, where things went wrong and I had to go through the process of rebuilding. And now I'm in this place where I can get to experience something real. Now that I've learned from those mistakes, going through this experience gave me so much perspective. Um, and I'm a person who uh, kind of agrees with that too. You know, when I think about relationships, like now I'm in a different place than I was. I actually feel like I'm on better footing than I was when I was actually in one. So what do you say to people who say, like, how are you helping, you know, other people do that? Like, what makes you the, the expert? What does make you the expert in what it is that you're talking about? Yes, uh, as you said, uh, similar, uh, like as you said about Brandy, I will repeat the same that I went through my own journey of lack of self-love and I have to face the consequences of not loving myself. It was uh, eventually I end up in a hospital for an operation, which was a part of my story, a long story about that. <laughs> But yeah, I have to face the consequences of not loving myself and then I realize the importance of self-love and learn to love myself. So yes, the fact that uh, I'm an expert on this is because I've been through my own journey of lack of self-love and then embracing self-love. So I understand that why self-love is important because I have my own personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and sometimes experience can be like the best teacher, right? Um, I'm the I'm I'm a person who when I go through things, I used to be victim mentality used to be prevalent to me. And then what I would always ask, why? Like, why do I have to why do I have to go through these things? And something that my dad would tell me, he would be he would say, Look, if you're being molded into a healer, then you have to go through certain things because you can't teach anybody anything unless you've actually been through it yourself you know exactly. that's true yeah like you know you wouldn't you wouldn't go to a doctor who never went to medical school you know <laughs> like other, so you you want you want someone who's done a surgery or two before they cut you open you know or at least have been trained by some you know have been trained first so it's it's one of those things where instead of thinking about it in a way of like why do i have to go through this you know sometimes it's the experience that you need for your path i believe in purpose and, you know, finding finding purpose and the experiences that we have in life leading to said purpose and, you know, creating the environment for you to be successful in what your purpose is. And I think that's a part of it. You know, the experiences make you the expert, being able to navigate through it in a healthy way. And I think um, 
that's what I find so cool about doing the show and being able to talk to people like you and like Brandy and everybody else who I talk to because, you know, you don't just have these experiences and, you know, just use it for yourself. You take these experiences and you say, okay, now that I've helped myself get through them, how can I help somebody else who's dealt with the same thing get through it? easier than I had to because I had to figure it out on my own how can I make this easier for someone else and I, it, it's just really cool seeing other people transform that that like that exactly and yes that reminds me of like years ago when I was working on my own healing and like as you said it's a lifelong journey so I am still working on my own healing and as I help my clients heal, I heal myself. But yes, when I was just starting out on this journey, I would ask myself, why is this happening to me? Why me? Why do I have to go through all of this? Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, like at that time, I didn't know the answer because I didn't start in my coaching business at that time as I was just starting out with my own healing at that time so yes the answer was definitely this that uh, i needed to go through this so i know the consequences of lack of self-love so i can help other people love themselves okay and yes exactly like if i haven't uh, been through my own journey of lack of self-love if i grow up in an environment where i was told you are loved you are protected you will always be loved, etc. If I have received those messages, chances are I will be doing something different because I wouldn't know the importance of self-love. Yeah, yeah. Or you would know it, but you didn't have to go through the experience of having to learn, you know, how important it actually is. You would have just had it. And I think- exactly. You know, and I think, you know, I think, I don't know if it was, the, I've recorded two episodes. This is my second episode today. I, I don't know if I said it in this one or another one where I said, look, if that's not your experience, then that's great. That's a good thing. If you didn't have to go through this, this experience, that's awesome. But other people have, like, you know, yeah. And I think I come from a place where, you know, to some things I can get genuinely curious because I was lucky enough to not have experienced it. So that doesn't mean that I need to judge a person who has experienced certain things and being like, isn't that common sense? No, to it's not to everybody. If I had like, if I have grown up with the thoughts and uh, like, if I was told growing up that you are loved and self love is important, chances are I would have believed that every child grew up with the same thinking every child is told the same so yeah. I probably wouldn't have bothered to start a self-love coaching business <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly and I mean I wouldn't be here right um because even the show was a product of me looking for purpose and I think that's why I love stressing the importance of purpose and I love talking to people who are in their purpose and finding their purpose because I had to, you know, I was that person who would pray and be like, why am I here? Like, what am I, what am I here for? And not understanding that. So having that experience of, you know, being that person, there are other people who think the same thing right now. Like, why am I here? You know, what is the meaning to my life? And, you know, I can't tell you that because it's going to be different, but I can tell you, you know, you are not the only person who has struggled with that, you know, not knowing who you are, what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And, you know, there are plenty of people who went down one path initially thinking that that was the way. And then they realized later, like, wait, I want to be doing something else. This isn't fulfilling. And then showing people you can live a fulfilling life and do things that make you happy and still make the money that you need and still, you know, be able to survive. You can even thrive in this life. So, you know, if I didn't have those experiences, I wouldn't be here. Exactly. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Our experiences are, they can either 
become our teachers and we can use them to teach others and inspire others or we can become a victim of the experiences by holding on to what happened to us and saying that it was your fault you did this to me instead of accepting responsibility yes 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 uh victim mentality breaking victim mentality is something we talk about a lot here <laughs> because because it, it it doesn't work like you can't I don't think you can be successful with a victim mentality. Exactly. Because, because uh, more you are in victim mentality, harder it uh, gets for you because you are not accepting responsibility for what you did. You are only focusing on blaming other people, finding faults in other people, and that is kind of like easy. It's easier to find faults in other people than to find what is uh, what we did wrong or how we need to change accepting responsibility for the what we did or didn't do mm -hmm. that is a lot harder yeah absolutely absolutely it's 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 way harder and i think that's why some people avoid it right like exactly. I'm, no, I'm no psychologist or anything so take what i say with a grain of salt but i think um i think that's one of the root the root things of a narcissist is the That's not wanting to self-reflect like there can't there nothing's wrong with me everything is wrong with you so it's projection you know so it's important to be able to take accountability because it's you have to yeah, i think yes uh, as you said uh, i think uh narcissist is like they unconsciously they believe that something is wrong with them but because they don't want to accept responsibility they are like and just, just like in nlp language perception perception is projection so because they don't want to accept responsibility for them instead they are blaming uh, what they unconsciously believe onto someone else that no you are wrong yeah yeah, like I can't, I can't be wrong because what does that mean? You know, they're allergic to self-reflection. They're allergic to accountability. Those aren't things that they want. So therefore everything has to be everyone else's fault. But if everything is everyone else's fault, you will never get better because you never took accountability. You have to admit that you need to change, you know, to change. Exactly. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that said, I'm not going to take up your entire, well, it would be day. I was going to say evening because it's evening here, but it's the morning for you. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I do appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for coming on today. I really appreciated the conversation that we were able to have um, and everything that we were diving into, you know, I said it before, you are more than welcome to come back anytime you would like to come back. Um, I enjoyed the conversation, plus I feel like there's a lot that you can dive into in terms of self-love and finding the necessary um, healing and the, the the resources to be able to do it, right? Um, everyone knows, oh, you need to love yourself, but I feel like it's a completely different beast to know what it actually means to love yourself. Um, because it requires work. Do you want to tell people a little bit more about what it is that you can do and like what not you can do, what it is that you do and you know where to find you if they're looking for those types of services? Just tell them a little bit about your business and where to find you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speaking with you and like uh, as you said, uh, we much of us uh, kind of aware that we need to love ourselves but it's a completely different story of learning how to love yourself because like i have noticed women who are like uh, they will think that they love themselves because they got their nails done their pedicure manicure etc like yeah. if i would ask my clients what did you do to love yourself they would be like i got my hair done i got my nails done and Yes, that's a great, that's a, some great external self-care, but if you are uh, judging yourself, if you are holding on to anger and resentment for an ex who may have abused you, if you are blaming other people, that 
it's not really self love because regardless of what all the external self care you can do you are still in that victim mentality you are still kind of judging yourself judging other people so yes it's a kind of a whole different journey of knowing how to love yourself and how it works oh so, yeah yes the the way your listeners can connect with me is through facebook they can send me a message on facebook they can go to my website uh, elevateselflove.com and they can get uh, a free free ebook on top 10 ways to give yourself the love you deserve and where i go more deeper into what i was talking about right now and and trust me none of the top 10 ways is that go and get yourself a spa or manicure or pedicure yeah. none of it uh, none of the top 10 ways is that so if that is what you think self love is you really need to get my book <laughs> and uh, i do have a free challenge that i offer to women since i only work with women it is the challenge is only for women and uh, in the free 5 day self love challenge we work on what we talk about here we go more deeper into it we talk about self love forgiveness how to forgive other people how to forgive yourself letting go of beliefs that are not serving you so if you are interested in doing that challenge it's a it's a one on one challenge so we meet uh, one on one we like you get a lot more of my time one on one than in a group because i prefer doing it one on one since uh, self love is different for different people so i do it one on one so if you are interested in doing that challenge it's a uh, application process so reach out to me on facebook my name is on facebook i am by karishma gautam just write my name and you most likely will see me or i can give the link to marisa and hopefully she will add it in the show notes yes uh, send me a message on send me a message that you are interested in doing the challenge and the application process is really just uh, i will ask you a couple of questions of what's the reason you are interested in the challenge how committed are you what do you want to learn and uh, also if you have uh, like if you when you reach out to me if you tell me you listen to this podcast chances are i will like respond as soon as possible to you because if you have taken time to listen to a podcast on self love it already shows that you are more committed to self love than someone who has just found me randomly without listening to a podcast on self love so yes uh, if you are interested in any of those things do reach out to me and i would love to work with you Awesome. Awesome. So yes, we will link everything um, in the description. I'll make sure I'll uh, include it on the, the the flyers and all of that. Um, again, like I said, thank you for coming on. I do appreciate it. Y'all uh, check her out. Um, like I said, if getting uh, that there's eBooks, there's free one-on-one -on -one courses. So she's offering a lot. So check her out. Let, let me know what you think. Um, and thank you for listening today. Um, one thing that I did note, so I'm going to have to save this for later. What does self-love look like? That that sounds like a completely different conversation um, to have because I, I find that very true. A lot of people do think that self-love is how you take care of yourself. But oh, is it such a bigger iceberg under the surface, you know? Exactly. So that uh, self-care, that uh, external pampering that we give to ourselves, getting our nails done, makeup, manicure, pedicure, etc. That is just the tip of the iceberg. However, if self-love is a lot deeper, it uh, goes a lot deeper and... Self-love is about treating yourself with kindness, being kind to yourself, being polite to yourself, letting go of uh, any anger and resentment you may have towards yourself or towards other people because obviously if you are holding on to anger, that is weakening your immune system. That is 
you are not giving love to your immune system if you are holding on to negative emotions. Yeah. So letting go of anything that is not serving you or your body. And it's like a, it's uh, treating yourself the same way you will treat a child or you will treat a loved one. If you will not say to a loved one that you are unworthy, you are not loved, don't say that to yourself. Yes. Which uh, often sometimes women do because of the experiences they may have or what they believe about themselves. For example, if for some reason, uh, uh, let's say like uh, the conditional love we sometimes may get from our parents while growing up, like if you did well in school, you you get a reward, you get love from your parents. However, if you didn't perform so well in school, you don't get that love, you get a scolding and beating up, especially if your parents are not so conscious or aware of the fact that your grades don't reflect what you grow up in life, what you become in life, if they are not so conscious about that fact. Chances are if you haven't done well in school, you get beaten up and then based on that experience, you may grow up thinking that I will be loved when I do S, Y, Z. For example, I will be loved when I get a good job or I perform well in school. Yeah. So if you if you are if you have grown up with that conditional love, chances are you will be giving yourself conditional love too. You will be saying to yourself that I will love myself when I lose ten pounds, or when I get a good job, when I get a promotion. So yes, yeah. self love is understanding that it's unconditional. It's you need to love yourself regardless of your circumstances. Yeah. Your circumstances won't change by thinking that once it's change, I will love myself. Love yourself while you are going through that mess in your life that you may be experiencing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it, it, it's a it's a different thing to know you are worth it always. You are worth exactly. it always. You can accept that there are things that you need to change and still love yourself. Even a part of loving yourself is accepting that you, knowing that certain things need to change. You know, that exactly. that's another way that you can show that you love yourself. But, you know, you don't have to wait to be loved or to feel worthy or to feel worth it. You deserve it always. And to know that, you know, is a, is a it's such a freeing experience and i feel like it's something that everybody deserves but not everybody believes that they deserve it exactly yes yes so yeah that in a sense that is really what self-love is and it's not just doing that all that external pampering and again i'm not saying that don't do external pampering if it makes you happy yeah, if Go it makes you it. feel good, it's a version. It's it's a part of it, but it's not the entire thing. Exactly. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. With that said, um, y'all, thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you're looking for me on social media, you can find me at Marissa Y17 on Instagram and TikTok. If you're looking for Thinker versus Speaker, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Thinker versus Speaker and Thinker versus Speaker official on TikTok. You can also check out our website. That's where I'm going to link everything from this episode. You can watch this episode there or our old episodes along with if you want to come on the show, we got a link for you to get on the calendar so you can, you know, have a conversation with me. Let me know what you're interested in talking about and we can set all of that up. Again, that's going to be at thinkaversespeaker.com. It's just so much there. Just check it out. Let me know what you guys think because it's a whole rabbit hole. Literally, there's a blog called The Rabbit Hole on there if you want to check that out too <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's a whole host of things for you to check out at thinkaversusweeker.com check it out let me know what you think um and get caught up with us again i'm so happy to have you did you have anything else for the people before you get out of here i just wanted to give them the message that they are loved and they are worthy of loving themselves yes 
Yes, 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 yes. I love it. We're, we'll we'll drop the mic out right there. I won't even add anything else to it. It's a great point to end on. Thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. Again, I appreciate you for coming on. You are more than welcome to come back anytime. It was great meeting you. Thank you for reaching out to come on the show. Like I said, it meant a lot from me. Um, And then just knowing, because y'all, we never mentioned the fact that Miss Krishma is in Australia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's a kind of great technology connected us all over the world yeah 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 so it's really cool that you know these messages can get as far as they're getting so like i said all the way out in australia i appreciate you reaching out and i'm glad that we were able to make this happen I'm glad to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, not a problem. Not a problem. So with that note, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. And then I'll send you a message with everything that you need, you know, going forward and how we go forward. But again, thank you for your time. I appreciate you. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. And you have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well. <laughs> Thank you.